Денес ке тука со нас да ни одржи едно предавање во склоп на проектот кој што го води организацијата на овие мои драги луѓе Коста и Нада Милкови за идеите се работи. Тоа се врски со конекции со Оксфорд, од каја што ми доаѓаат професори, магистранти, докторанти да ни пренесат некоја своје искуство. Јас само ќе се заблагодарам на луѓето со кои што се работувам и ќе го отстапам на подиумот еден час на Кейт да ви ги пренесе своите искусства и знаења за образовни систем во Велика Британија. Кейт, the floor is you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much for a kind welcome here. Let's hope the computer stays. Brilliant. How confident are you in English? Very confident, moderately confident, slightly worried. Can I have a look? Who, who is very confident? <laughs> Boston, very, very, very. Tom, 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 Tom is English. Hopefully he's very confident. Who, who's moderately confident? Yeah? yeah? You can understand quite well, but you're shy to speak. Is that right? Yes. And who is kind of slightly nervous? This isn't a test, by the way. I just want to know how fast I can talk. Moderate. Moderate. Okay. I was asked to come and talk to you about the British educational system. I understand you're training to be teachers. Is that right? Yes. For primary school or for secondary school? Primary. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to do a bit of an experiment. So I need you to take part. Is that okay? And we're going, I'm going to teach this in the style of a British University undergraduate workshop, which will be probably quite different to the way you're used to learning in university here. So you can have a taste of how British teachers might train, but we're going to do that while talking about the primary education system. Okay, so we're learning two things at once. You're seeing a little bit about some of the way in which we learn in universities in the UK and also hopefully learn a bit about our primary education system. Does that all sound like a plan? So it might mean that I might ask you to do some things that you find different or unusual. Don't worry, just go with it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I've asked Hannah to help. Hannah? is going to help. Tom will help. He doesn't know what he's going to do yet. But he will help. <laughs> because the thing that's very important is how we teach others is a product of how we have learned ourselves. So the way that you teach children or you will teach children in the schools that you end up teaching in will be a reflection of how you learned both as children and also at university. Because you will teach not just according to the theories that you learn in these classrooms, but you will also teach according to your experience. You will find yourself doing things that your primary school teacher did to you, or saying things or explaining things in a way that your teachers did to you when you were small. I hope that's not controversial. One of the big values of the British um, education system that we hold very highly is that there's an idea of an exchange of information. That it's not just the case that the lecturer or the professor or the teacher stands and gives knowledge, and your role as a learner is to absorb knowledge. In our system, we place a very high value that yes, um, the professor or the teacher is there to help with knowledge, but also they are to be a guide to help the students or the pupils, so whether they be little children or students in a university setting, to actually understand things for themselves, but also to hear and share their own knowledge and their own understanding. Because your opinions of what I'm about to say today in the British system would matter as much as the information I'm going to give you. So your thoughts about whether I am talking total rubbish or whether what I'm saying is very insightful and makes a good deal of sense, for us in the UK is as important as any factual knowledge that I'll give to you. Does that make sense? Is that very different understanding? <laughs> when I was a student, I studied for a year in the Czech Republic, and I think the Czech system is more similar to your Macedonian system. 
I think so. So I hope I understand where you're sat now and the system that you're in. And I will say that it was a big shock to me to go from the British system to the Czech system. I spent the first few weeks sort of walking around university in Brno, kind of like a frightened rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> so in the true British fashion, I'm going to start by asking you, what do you know about the British school system? Now, you can say this in Macedonian, if you like, and Costa will translate, yeah. so please don't feel shy about your English. But as I said, a British university workshop depends upon you participating, and in fact, your marks at the end of term would be dependent upon you answering. <laughs> we want, you have to give your opinions, there's no choice. So, do you know anything about the British system at all? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Start with the obvious things. Start with the obvious things. What, what kind of impressions do you have? Do you think it's a good system? Do you think it's probably a system that maybe should be copied? Or do you think it's just a system that is different? What are your impressions? Right, okay, we're going we're to do some modelling here. Tom, <laughs> Tom will show you how this is done, okay? So this is about you learning how British students learn as much as it's about us telling you about the British system. Um, actually, let's start with Hannah, because she's South African, so she's not British. Half okay? British. She's, she only uses us for the passport. She, <laughs> she grew up in South Africa. She went to South African schools. She didn't, like, I always went to British state schools. So, Hannah, growing up in South Africa, what were your impressions of the British system? Did you have any? Well, so I think the first thing I'd say is that if you, of course it's more complicated, if you were white and you were privileged growing up in South Africa, you, you actually the schools were very similar yeah. to, to the British schools. But the average school in South Africa, which would have been under the Bantustan system, was very much a style of, as you've already described, where uh, the curriculum was very much decided by the state. Um, so there wasn't much uh, choice or, or um, flexibility for the, for the teacher to kind of adapt the curriculum to their style or to, um, innov to be innovative with, um, with the curriculum and the material they were working okay. with. It was, you had specific worksheets yeah. you should just execute. Okay. Um, and that seems to me to be quite different to the British system, which incorporates um, um, more kind of peer-to-peer -peer horizontal learning instead of this vertical relationship. Okay. <coughs> did you all understand that? Because she's got an accent you might not be familiar with. Did anyone not quite understand what she's saying? And I'll ask Costa to translate yeah, just I to make sure. Because, she, because of her accent is quite different. Her accent is perfect. Is it fine? Your accent is yeah. perfect. <laughs> Nearly as perfect as my standard Southern British one. <laughs> okay. If I if I can just interrupt yeah. you for a sec, I think there is. A, I, it's, this is as much as a question yeah. to the students and probably to Professor Trich about. Uh, I've heard that actually the Cambridge system of textbooks have been introduced into education, and I know very little about it. Do you yeah. know something about it? Have you heard about it? Знаете нещо за нея Кембридж система, че той е са учебниците сега? Учениците учат по Кембридж. I thought, they, do they know something about it? Have they come across yeah. the knowledge? Yeah. Yeah. Is it English? For English language? No, no, it's for, subject? for all subjects. Maths and science. Oh, yeah, I think, yes. Maths and science. Mm -hmm. Just uh, recently introduced. Okay. But I don't know how much mm -hmm. or what is going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what, what Hannah says is very interesting. Because I think her impressions are simultaneously correct and very incorrect of the British school system. So the first thing I want to say is the British school system has a lot of controversy about it right now. In fact, if you are to look at the British news today, you will see that the teachers are going on strike again. And we have all kinds of issues that we're facing in the British school system right now. And some of them will be similar to the ones here in Macedonia and some will be different. So the similar ones, because I think this is a problem the world over, 
is that we have an argument over funding. How do we finance education? How do we finance teacher salaries? Do we pay teachers enough? Um, how do we finance technology in schools? Because we think it's a good thing for children to have access to good computers, but that's expensive. Um, how do we cope with old school buildings? In Britain, uh, a lot of our primary education system was established in the 19th century, so almost 150 years ago. And a lot of our primary school buildings are 150 or 170 years old. I went to one like that. Now, in the communities, people have an emotional attachment to these old buildings. Because in, say, for example, the small town I grew up in, in a lot of the schools, someone went to that school, and so did their parents, and so did their grandparents. So people love the building. But they are maintained. But they the maintenance good. is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> How do you maintain a building that's 150 or 170 years old? And how is a building that is that old able to meet the needs of children in 2016? Those are some of the challenges we face on a, on a financing point of view. We also have challenges with our curriculum. <coughs> we have challenges of our curriculum, what should children learn, what subjects are important. And there is a big debate at the moment about do we need more traditional subjects so back to the old-fashioned traditional subjects, or do we need modern subjects? Um, so there was... We uh, just loved your, your textbook. Yeah. Don't tell us that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so some of, the, for example, one of the uh, government proposals at the moment is that every single primary school teacher needs to be able to teach coding. Do you know what I mean by coding? I don't. Like no. computer programming. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Like not just how to use a computer, mm -hmm. but how to create computer programs. How to use those computer, those software languages. languages. Uh -huh. Now, our primary school teachers, on the whole, are taught to teach children to read and write, mm -hmm. to learn um, basic numeracy, um, science, history, geography, those kind of subjects that I'm sure you're learning how to teach the children. Not how to program computers. And if we even go down that route, the problem is what we teach, and they're saying one of the proposals at the moment is every child from the age of five should be taught computer programming. If the child is taught to do that at five, one, it will be very basic, yeah? Obviously, it's a five-year-old, a normal five-year-old, not a genius. <laughs> the second thing is, is technology is changing so fast that by the time a curriculum goes through the necessary committees and is taught to the teacher to teach the child, it will be out of date. And that is before we even think that that five-year-old that coding they learn will not help them get a job when they're 18, will it? Because technology is changing so fast. So we have another controversy. Do we need more traditional mathematics, higher standards of traditional mathematics, more rigorous teaching of traditional English grammar, spelling, all of those kind of things? Or do we need to have coding? Another controversy. Another controversy we have is we have a very strict national curriculum. And this is where I think Hannah's impression was incorrect. There is no flexibility for the teacher in what they teach in Britain, or very little. It's who's, who's, very- Who's creating the, the, the curriculum? The government. The government. Um, is there any particular body uh, that uh, is- It's the Department of Education. So if you want to go um, to the website www.gov.uk forward slash national curriculum, mm -hmm. it will all be laid out. Mm -hmm. And so the teachers have a very strict way and what they're supposed to teach, and it's supposed to be the same in every school in the country, more or less. And that's only for the 
primary school or in secondary? Primary into secondary as well. Secondary as well, but then children have a choice of more of a choice of subjects when they get to 14. So when you're 14, you can choose to take more of some subjects and less of some others. But um, the curriculum is laid down. And the problem with this, this happened in the 1980s, is they are changing the curriculum all the time. And then they want to make sure that the children are being taught the curriculum. So the teachers have to produce evidence mm -hmm. that they're teaching the curriculum. Which means that as a teacher, you have to plan your lessons mm -hmm. and then you have to write reports, not just for the children, so that you have a record of how they're doing, or at the end of the year where you have to take it to the parents. You do that in Macedonia. Mm -hmm. The most terrifying day of my school days was the annual day that the report was sent to my parents. But they have to produce written evidence for the school inspectors that they have taught the, the, the curriculum and evidence to show it. So they have far less flexibility. If you go into a British primary school classroom, I think you would be shocked at how it seems to be very informal and how there is a value on the children learning from each other. But all of that is also set in a curriculum. The children must have this much time for imaginative play if they are under five. Because in England, we start compulsory schooling at four, which is also controversial. A shock to me when I arrived. Yeah. Total shock. We start yes. compulsory schooling at four. What age is it here in Macedonia? What age six. is it here? Six. 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 Yeah. So at four, they have a set number of hours a day the children must play. And the teacher <laughs> must show that the children have played. <laughs> and it must be a special type of play. It must be imaginative and creative play. So the teacher will have to show evidence that they provided the environment and what sort of toys. So have the children been using, uh, 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 do you know what I mean by a Wendy house? No. Like a toy house mm -hmm. that um, the children can go in and pretend it's their house with like a little toy kitchen. And are we doing that, or were they? Um, uh, I don't know. Um, playing with dressing up clothes and put, and acting out stories from a book, and all of this must be codified. That's quite contradictory. Yes, exactly, exactly. You're, now you understand what's controversial. It has to be imaginative and you creative. You must be imaginative and creative. We demand imagination and creativity. <laughs> and, um, and then the children are all assessed. And then the schools are compared with each other and the results are published. And so all of this creates a lot of controversy with teachers. Um, and there's a lot of change. There's an awful lot of change. So I want to say that as a starter because I want you to know that the British system is probably facing some similar challenges to the Macedonian one. It might look different and we might be asking different questions, but we have similar challenges. A room full of trainee teachers in England would have similar challenges. Okay, so... I'm going to ask you some questions. I said, please participate. We're trying to make this more feel like a British university system lecture so you can get an idea. What do you think are the compulsory subjects for children in primary school in Britain at the moment? So computer programming isn't quite yet. <laughs> what do you think? Compulsory subjects. Mm -hmm. Maths. Maths. Yes, we want our children to be able to count. Good. Another one. The language. Sorry? The language. English. Language. Yes. English. Languages. Languages. Foreign languages. Foreign Only languages. English. That's another controversy <laughs> because the reputation is that us English people are very bad at languages. <laughs> um, you only have, until you're 11, you only have to learn English. So grammar and spelling. And, so. and usually, what's the, what's the second language? French, often. When you start at 11, it's usually French. Um, sometimes German. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So French or German. Um, sometimes Spanish. Spanish not so often, but it's becoming more popular. So, okay, so our children learn English and our children learn maths. What else do they learn? This is, this is, this is, these are obvious questions, by the way. Don't be frightened. So do our children need to know whatever happened in our country? Yeah? You can learn, uh, uh, shout at me in Macedonian if you like. Tom? They probably learned history. History! Yay! Okay. <laughs> this side of the room, maybe you're going to be more talkative. So we've got English, maths and history. Name another subject. Sorry? Physical education. Physical yeah, education. Yeah, yeah. We have a set number of hours every child in the country must do sport. And the teacher has to provide written evidence they have done the sport. In creative manner. In a creative manner. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was joking with Costa. Um, in some schools, when they say physical education, that can mean anything from like football to dance. Just something that involves activity. And so I grew up in, uh, I said, a small town in a traditional part of the country. And so we did like sport, but we also learned country dancing. We all had to learn country dancing every week. <laughs> every week we did country dancing. Get ready for maple <laughs> dancing? <laughs> you were getting? Yeah, like yeah, traditional. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maple dancing. Is we did one maple of those. dancing. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what maple dancing is? Explain it, please. I had to do this oh, every sure. single week <laughs> during the summer, from the age of seven to the age of eleven. Yeah. And there's a big white pole mm -hmm. that's maybe uh, three meters tall, mm. and it has long ribbons in many colours. And each person takes a ribbon, and you skip around the pole mm. like twenty people. And you have to skip in a certain order so the ribbons make a pattern. Mm. So there we are. That was a compulsory <laughs> subject. Um, <laughs> but, but that comes under physical education. Brilliant. Another one. Geography. Geography. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. You're getting the hang of being a British undergraduate. Well done. Good. <laughs> right. Let me give you the rest yeah. of the list. Music, music yeah. yes, music. <laughs> music, music, music's compulsory. So whether they're just like shaking a shaker, you know, playing drums and stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Music. Anything else? What are the compulsory subjects here? What must you must What must you teach your children in Macedonia? I'm assuming maths. I'm assuming Macedonian. I'm assuming physical education. Mm. Oh. Yes, 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 yes. Is it compulsory? Yes. You can't get away with not teaching them it. Music, history, painting, art. Yeah, geography, art. Yeah. yeah. So, like in England, another one. Science. Science. Sciences. Sciences. Yeah. Some geography. Some geography. Anything else? Social education. Social education. First. A second language. And a second language. How old must you be to have a second From language? First grade. From the first grade. And from the fourth grade, they have second language. From Oskodanio, Storia, Sistranska, Sveto. Sveto, Yeah, from five. Yeah. No, I, I understand Macedonian. I, my first degree was in Slavonic languages, so I can understand. I just will reply in Czech. So. <laughs> Computer programming here as well, so information technology. Here we are. I'm going to shock you. One of the compulsory subjects for all children in school in England from the age of four to the age of 16 is religion. Is that surprising? More or less, because we have, but it's not compulsory. I think it's elective. It's elective. Mm. And the way we teach religion, it's not about... It's in, which, in which grade, sorry? Yeah. From ev every grade, from age four to age, 18, to age 16. And it, the idea is that they teach about how other people believe. So each child will learn about the different festivals of different religions. Kind of yeah, it's comparative religion. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that the children learn about the other religions of the world and the other religions, because in Britain we have a lot of immigration. So there'll be a big, big mixture 
of different religious faiths in some communities. In my community growing up, not so much, but in some communities, a lot. So I, I grew up in a, a town that was 100% almost white British. Um, but we learnt about um, Islam, we learnt about Buddhism, <coughs> we learnt about Hinduism, um, all this kind of thing. And that's a compulsory subject. So, from what I've said so far, what is similar about the British system to Macedonia and what is different? What have I said about the British system that has really shocked you? The age. The age. Yeah. The age. Great. Well, let's talk about that. This is, this is a very British university thing to do. How did you feel <coughs> when I said that children must go to school full time at the age of four? Do you think, were you shocked? Yeah. Because some of these children, remember, school year starts September the 1st. Some of these children became four on August the 31st. So some of the youngest in the year are almost three-year-olds. Mm. So what impact do you think that has on a primary school teacher? How does that change your job? You feel like you're in nursery, huh? You're in nursery. <laughs> some primary school teachers in England have made complaints that children come to their schools and aren't toilet trained. I wouldn't care for the teacher, I do care for the children. Yes, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So what do you think is good about children going to school at the age of four? Nothing. Nothing, 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 nothing. So it's just over here. So it will be, it will be from nine in the morning until three o'clock in the afternoon. And the children will have some time for play, but it'll be structured and imaginative play. <laughs> But the children will, at the same time, be taught um, reading and writing, and they will be taught maths, and they will do art and music, and some basic science ideas. So probably a tank of water. They do they have to sit in a classroom? Yes. In a traditional classroom? They are often the tables are in um, squares, mm -hmm. so children often sit in circles. And sometimes on the floor. Um, occasionally, sometimes when they're like when kept. they have imaginative play. When they have imaginative play, <laughs> uh, I would say this is one of the big controversies because in Britain, every so often, people say in other countries in Europe, people don't start until they're six. So, what do you think are the bad things about going to school at four? Compulsory. The fact it's compulsory. What do you think is bad about that? Yeah, 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 please, talk in Macedonian. Talk in Macedonian, yeah. we'll translate yeah. someone was, yeah. yeah. He thinks it could be positive because they're socialized very early. They're, they're socialized early, yeah. Well, and on the other side, I would think that it, it affects family family relationships, I really do think. Yeah. Uh, I, I, grew, I lived in four years in, in the UK, and that was one of my main concerns, basically that yeah. children didn't have enough time with their parents, especially with the father, that was usually the case. Yeah. That was a big, I, I, I found it really concerning. <laughs> it's because, isn't it interesting, when children are in school, you as the teacher will spend more time with that child than their parents will. Because you, when you think about how, oft, how long the child is awake before they go to school and after they come home from school, at the age of four, can anyone think of a, Another yeah. objection, maybe, that's... Time to, to sleep there because from seven to three or seven? Nine. Mm -hmm. Nine to three. Sometimes they will have, like, a short nap time after lunch. In fact, I remember one of my earliest childhood memories is compulsory nap time. And we would all have to fold our arms on the desk. I put my computer down like this. And we would have to put our head like this. And that was compulsory something <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you can't <laughs> stay like that even if you weren't sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can anyone think of any other re 
reasons that in Britain, some people are saying we shouldn't do this anymore. Four years old is too young. So someone's talked about the impact on family relationships. Someone else has um, talked about how, how, how productive this is for children learning. I mean, how much, how much can a child learn in a classroom at that age that they can't learn from being in a family environment? Or in kindergarten. Or in kindergarten. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the one of. So do you think Macedonia is better for six years old, or Britain is better for four years old? Can we have a vote. Let's have a vote. Macedonia is better. Macedonia. 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 Yes. Macedonia. So there we are. What about another difference we have? Um, in Macedonia, is the curriculum a very strict? Is it set by the state, or the individual schools have choice? By the state. By the state. <coughs> and the teachers have to send reports, like in England. Yeah, uh, it's quite similar right now because we implemented the Cambridge system. Yeah. So we are very similar with all this that we said. Yeah. And previously it was it was the same. It was the same. Inspections and reports and paperwork. <laughs> before that, it was even more defined of what of what they should do before before the this system. Now uh, she thinks that teachers are having more kind of independence. Uh, I think in her opinion, too much. Uh, so they have more kind of uh, free free choice. The teacher can choose, uh, for example, the side literature, the reading, the reading list, or something like that. Okay, yeah. but when we say Cambridge, we only think of on two on subjects. Two subjects. Two subjects. Math, math and, and science. science. And yeah, science. so it's like the textbooks basically mm -hmm. we've got from the Cambridge University Publishing, which won't be used across the whole of the UK. Well, so uh, as as I'm familiar, they're not. Yeah, exactly. They're just produced by the by Cambridge University. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're seeing some of the interesting dynamics in our education systems. I think it, it's fascinating to me that some of the challenges you have here are very similar to the challenges we have in the UK, but maybe just on the surface look a little different. But deep down, we're asking the same questions. Why are we educating children? What do we want from the education system? How are we going to ensure that every child has the best possible education, regardless of their background? How are we going to make sure that we have children who are educated that means that they can be productive members of society at the end of it? That they will be good and able to get jobs, they'll have the skills that they need to function and be productively employed. Um, what do you think the biggest challenges are here in Macedonia for the education system. I've mentioned some of the ones in England. Do you remember the ones I said about in England? Someone wants to shut them back at me so I can check you understood. Yeah. Yeah. The salary, the salary is massive. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. In in my city, in Oxford, we have a problem that teachers can't afford to live in Oxford mm. because the house prices and the house rents are so high, and so the schools sometimes are seeing teachers just stay for one year and go. There's no continuity. It's very difficult to build a good department and a good management structure in a school because teachers can't afford to stay. They can't afford to live in Oxford. Is that a similar problem to problems in Macedonia? Some people are looking at me blankly, some people <laughs> are nodding shyly. Well, I, yeah. I think what, I, I guess what is at the back is that the salaries are so low anyhow, it will be difficult to live anywhere. <laughs> yeah, so it's a similar. More or less. 
Yeah. But we can afford to leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Oxford, Oxford is exceptionally bad. Um, <laughs> what about the use of play at school? At six, do your children play in school? I think it, what they say is minimal, it's minimized. It's really solid study. So, so when you're at the age of six, you're in rows, a little bit like this lecture mm -hmm. theatre, but less comfortable seats. Perhaps. You see, in, in England, we'll carry around sitting in circles around a table until you're 16. So that the children are learning from each other as much as they're learning from the teacher, the dynamic changes in the room, the re, sort of the exchange of knowledge changes. The children will be sat around That's tables. something I really, really like. Yes. That is yes. something I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Not at all. You see, this is why when it would come to a session like this in a British university, I would ask that question and people would be shouting question answers back at me. Because they have spent all of their educational life being told your opinion matters. What you think of what I'm saying matters. The questions that you have matter. The way that you're thinking matters as much as the information I'm telling you. Because you're here not just to absorb information, but also to share what you know of the world. That we can, I can learn from you as much as you can learn from me. And you can learn from each other as much as you can learn from me. There's a very different... And because our children are taught this, even from sort of the age of four, it changes even up to university how people learn. Do you see how that whole system changes just because of the way that, in the first way, the kids learn? Um, I'm very pleased to be speaking to a group of educationalists today in Macedonia because you know who Janne Moskomensky is, yeah? yeah? Okay. Anyone know why today is a good day for Janne Amos Komensky? Janne Amos Komensky. Today? Today. 28th of March. It's his birthday. Oh, really? <laughs> and it's your birthday, too. And it's my too. birthday, too. Oh, yeah. 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 Happy birthday. Um, oh. So, um, Jan Amos Komensky, he, um, I'm going to say this now, because I always say this. My study of Komensky is as a theologian. Did you know he was a bishop? Yeah. He was a bishop. And so he really is a theologian, not an educational Episcopal. theorist. Um, but that's by the by. Um, he wrote a book called Orbis Pictus. Are you familiar with that book? It's like a small picture dictionary for children. And it's in three languages. It's in Czech and Latin and German. And each page has a picture and then a little explanation of what's going on underneath. And the first chapter of this book is an introduction. And it has a dialogue between the teacher and the student. And a rough translation into English is that the teacher says, student, come with me and I will show you understanding. And the student says, why? <laughs> <laughs> and the teacher is trying to explain to this child. And this is because you can see the world around you and you can understand how the world works and your place in it. And he sets out his theory, very basic Kamensky theory of education, that what you learn in the classroom has to reflect the world outside. That what you learn and what you teach as teachers should help, your ch help the children relate to the world better. It's not just a kind of a, like a theory in their head that bears no resemblance to their life. And this exchange, I would argue, of information between yourselves as much as between me and you, is part of that learning. I think that is the main problem in our educational system. Yeah. Uh, really, because our uh, students are taught from the first grade they, they, that they have to listen. Mm. Yeah. And I have a big, big problem with my students, I must say that <laughs> when I insist. Some of you talk to me. This was great. <laughs> they have to prove it now. <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But did you say because
because because you know as as your as as your as as your professor says, you know, you're. It takes a long time to break out that idea because you've been trained that you are just to receive, mm. and you are to receive, and you're to be very diligent in writing that down and learning it, and then you'll have an exam, and you must know all of these things, mm. and um, and your worth and your value as a student is based on how many of these facts you can remember, yeah. Mm. So whether you get a good grade or a bad grade is about how many of these facts you can remember. I brought with me a marking scheme from a British university. I might leave it here, you might be interested in it. And this is a university that I did a um, postgraduate research diploma at. So I didn't do my undergraduate study at this particular university, it's called Canterbury Christchurch. And this is the marking scheme for, I can show you, it's six pages long. <laughs> for the essays, for the students. Now. And it's actually, although it talks about knowledge, the most important thing is argument and the student being able to use the knowledge they've learned, so the facts they've learned, to form their own opinion and to share it. So in order to get the best marks, effectively what has to happen is the professor has to learn something from you when they read your work. They have to learn some new insight about whatever subject it is that you're writing about because you have taken some of the factual information and you have formed your own opinions and you have expressed it in such a way that gives new understanding on the topic to get the best marks. If you simply write down all the things your professor has told you and pass it back, you will pass, but with very low grade indeed. Rewrite the text. Mm. Yeah, which is like the opposite way, I think, the way mm. you're taught here. Mm. When I went to a Czech university, um, I was um, really confused, my first exam, because I didn't realise I was supposed to know those facts. <laughs> I thought I was supposed to give my opinion. <laughs> it was a disaster. <laughs> and I didn't understand why so many people cheated in exams. Because they knew which facts were coming up. <laughs> and so they had them on cards and they put them with a drawing pin at the bottom of a desk. That here. And they like slide the card out from under the desk with their list of things they were supposed to know. You were doing that in my exam. Yeah. <laughs> now, the thing that was astonishing to me was two things. One, you could do that at a British university or even in a high school, but it probably wouldn't help you get very good marks. I mean, you have to know some facts, obviously. But unless you could actually demonstrate you have formed your own thinking, opinion, and being able to express that. And that can't be kind of put on a card and hidden under your desk with a drawing pin. Y you wouldn't get the good grades. And what's more, in a British university, if you're found cheating, I don't know, what's the punishment here? If you do that in an exam, what would happen to you? Someone who hasn't spoken to me yet. <laughs> if you cheated in an exam, like with the card and the facts, what would happen? <laughs> they say they don't, but they won't pass. That's that you'll be failed. Mm. In a British university, you would probably be expelled yes. and not allowed to return. And if you applied to another university and they saw you've been back. expelled, they wouldn't accept you. So the consequences for doing that are dire mm. for a British student. So I went to this Czech university without my crib card because I didn't want to get expelled. <laughs> Not knowing my facts and I failed the exam. So I'm realizing, I've, I, I said I had until 12. I, may, I think that the truth might be I think 12 somewhere is in between, yeah. mm. uh, the, between that system that uh, insists on 
European and the European yeah. only, and the Eastern system, if I may yeah. so, that insist on factography and, yeah. uh, yeah. and knowledge. The truth is some, somewhere in between, because I noticed that when I was in the States, you know, uh, the first, on the first class, the question of the professor was, what is your opinion? If he had an opinion, he wouldn't be in the class <laughs> of, about philosophy, about Plato, yeah. about things mm. that you, yeah. you know? Completely. As a teacher, you have to... Yeah. That's, you, yes, you've almost preempted my next question, which um, are, what is the weakness of this British approach? Mm. Because there are real weaknesses to this British approach. Can you think of one of the weaknesses? But what's most important is your own thoughts and your own opinions. You, you all think it's great because you don't have to learn a list of facts anymore and draw and pin them to the bottom of your desk. <laughs> okay, let me tell you my, my personal opinion. You can't form good opinions unless you know the facts. You have to know the facts. Because you can't just, for example, with history, make up the date of some battle. You can't, with geography, make up the location of a country. You have to know where it is. If what you're is, writing, what is your opinion? Where yeah. is the United States? No. <laughs> you know, what's your opinion? Does yeah, it share a border? It shares a border with Macedonia. Uh, well, that's just what you think. That's wonderful. Uh, uh, Can you produce a good argument, a coherent argument? Yeah. To which, you know, I think someone might try. It, it gets upset. I, I think I think your professor's right. I think we need somewhere. The ideal is somewhere between the two. Hmm. The, the idea is somewhere between the two because we can't just manage just opinions. But also, it's also that if your university system and your school system are distinct, so in school you learn to just regurgitate information, yeah. and then when you get to university, and you're just expected automatically to. You all of a sudden are told that knowledge is contested. Yes. And but your whole school career, you were just told that the the mm. textbook was the the best version of mm. this piece yeah. of knowledge. And so that can be a really hard jump for many students in South Africa who haven't been taught from a very young age to realize that knowledge is contested, that, that even professors have different opinions on history. Uh, and so that's, it's like, how do you, um, in, I, I, that's a question I'm really interested in as a, as a teacher too. You know, how do you, how do you enable that kind of contestation? Yeah. Exactly, how do you do that in a constructive way, in a healthy way? And as I said, how you're taught as children affects the way you then relate as adults as well to learning. Um, I think it'd be, I, I have a little dream one day. Maybe you can be like my first group to do this. I'll take you and put you in a British university seminar like with a bunch of British students and you'll kind of watch them in amazement. And then I'll set a group of British university students uh, a kind of Eastern style exam and watch them fail miserably because they don't know any of the facts. <laughs> you know, but it's, you know, there's somewhere in the middle and also, there's some, some things that we need to know. There are some objective facts, but there are some facts which are still open for debate. Um, you know, what really happened at such and such a battle? And it depends from someone's point of view. Whose point of view is it? Or what are the implications of that battle? What are the consequences? So this weekend just gone. Um, so yesterday was Easter for us in England. Yes. And um, they commemorated in Ireland, they commemorated for the first time the Easter Rising of 1916. Mm. Now, the Easter Rising in 1916 was when Ireland, the whole of Ireland, was still part of the United Kingdom. And a group of Irish nationalists uh, rose up against British rule. Now, for the Irish, these are brave people who took a stand against an oppressive imperial power and they need to be celebrated and marked. For some people in the north of Ireland and for many people in the rest of the United Kingdom, they were armed terrorists <coughs> who sought to destabilize the government during a vulnerable time in uh, the history, right in the middle of World War I. <coughs> Well, I can do interpretation. 
One fact, two interpretations. How do you teach that in schools? Welcome to the Balkans. You know? I mean, so that's the kind of, the Irish question is probably the closest we have to yeah. some of the questions you have in the Balkans. How do you teach that in schools responsibly? How do you teach that so that children have an understanding of different perspectives on the argument, can understand their own history, can be proud of their own history, but in a way which also understands the feelings and the perspectives and the history of the other? That's an interesting question I might leave you with. I think that uh, that kind of spirit or mentality mm. uh, here is uh, in a great way a legacy from the socialist past. Mm. Uh, and that is changing. Uh, yeah. Slowly, but it, it's, it, it is changing now. Yeah. And it will be interesting to see in, say, 20 years' time, the children that you have taught, how they respond in university settings, how they are thinking, how they are responding, how they are arguing, how they are they forming their own opinions. Um, that would be fascinating for me to see. Um, it's 12 o'clock. I don't know how much time we have. Do we say until? It's up to the to Trece and the group, really. I, I have no, no, no opinion on Trece. As I said, nothing is up to me. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a few more Wait, minutes. There are no facts. It's all just how you yeah. feel. <laughs> We can spend a few minutes more. 15, oh. 10, 15, yeah. 10, 15 anyone got, anyone minutes, got any fine. questions? Any questions? Please. Because I know that I've done a lot of try to model something here, and I know that a lot of you felt quite uncomfortable when I asked you to respond to me. Kako vi da stvarno to sa kom doznam? Kako vi na primjer ko insistiram baram ja se, ne znam ko insistiram na čas da zborim je, da komuniciram je i da su tamo nekakva atmosfera u kojoj možemo da razgovaram. Pretpostavljam da je nekomfortno, a ma zašto? Zato što ne ste kompaktni kao grupa ili jednostavno ne ste naučeni da upravite to? Ne ste naučeni samo. 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 Ne ste naučeni yeah. Why did they extend the, to the secondary is also compulsory education? Yeah. In UK? In yeah. UK. Yeah. It was to 16 until last year. Um, they changed it because children that leave school at 16 tend, by definition, to be those that aren't doing so well at school, um, which means that often they've struggled to get employment, so youth unemployment was very high, and often they um, were leaving school without the abilities to really hold down um, any form of employment long term. And so the government changed it and basically said that they have to stay until they're 18. And those last two years, they must reach a minimum standard of English and maths. Um, so those two years, they might mm -hmm. have to keep on retaking English and maths for those two years, mm -hmm. plus have some form of vocational training or some kind of apprenticeship or, or something. Zanayate, no, no, yeah, 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 apprenticeship or something. That's between 16 and 18. 16 and 18, yeah. So you were saying the people that felt uncomfortable when I asked them questions. There was someone over here who said she yeah, felt uncomfortable. Yeah, I wanted to know why they feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, because I have the same feeling when, when I'm in the classroom that when I ask, they feel quite uncomfortable. Do you feel that it's disrespectful to question? Do you think it's that? 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 If I may draw a parallel here, just recently I was in Belgrade speaking at a conference there and there were people from Moldova, from the former Soviet Union, Albania, Montenegro, Macedonia, Serbia, so uh, very common. And we were talking mm. about something similar, especially mm. adult education, yeah. adult learning. And um, I think from my experience, I've, yeah. I've studied, I've, I've done, let's say, Macedonian style education until I was 19. So I yeah. went between the standard seven yeah. 
to high school and then I just left more or less Macedonia and mm. I have not studied within this context ever since mm. in the last 25 years. So I, I, I was able to see both, you know, the yeah. difference between. And when I didn't ask questions, usually it was because uh, I felt that the teacher can ridicule me if I ask a question yeah. because I'm dumb. Usually that was yeah. the that was the, yeah. the challenge. And yeah. I, I was very surprised to hear that Russia is absolutely the same, even worse. Mm. Nobody asks questions because people will think you're stupid. About to say, are you were, were you were you scared that if you said something, either I would think that you were stupid, or I would think you had asked the wrong question? Mm. Was that a fear that you don't that you feel if you say something maybe, if unless it's like some kind of genius idea, <laughs> it's not it's not valuable to share with the group? Is that the case, or you or you you are just lazy? <laughs> I, I don't think they're lazy. I'm looking at these faces and I would say there's a majority of people have been listening very intently. They're engaged, they're taking in the information, they're processing it, and I can sort of see almost behind the eyes trying to go, what does this mean for me? What do I think about this? And I yeah, think... They, they have a reflection, right? And, and yeah. I'm, I'm trying to, to yeah. solve that problem, yeah. where, where the problem is, why, why they're not involved, why they're not engaged. Well, let's try uh, this. No, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying hard. Well, let, let's try this trick. <laughs> okay. Turn to the person sat next to you, I who I hope is your friend, because <laughs> you've sat next to them. Some of you might need to be like three. You girls at the back, go to three. And I want you to ask that question to each other. Okay, so hopefully the person next to you is someone you trust. Because I know that you'll leave here, and I know you'll go for lunch, and I know you'll talk about this later, mm. and I know you may well have, you know, a good chat about it. I will help those <laughs> yeah? Because I, I, I know you've got thoughts, I know you've got yeah, opinions, and I know you're very intelligent and attentive students. So try, try this, because this is gentle, this is helping you, <laughs> and it's less frightening than the big group. And so talk to each other, okay? So if you start with you two girls there, you talk to each other. You two, you two girls there, you two girls there, you two there. So just, what, what are your thoughts on what I've said, what I've shared? What, what about your thoughts on this experience? You're two boys, but I wasn't allowed. pointing at you, yeah. I was pointing at these lovely ladies here. Honestly. You know, what, what, what are your thoughts? What, do you, what, what do you think about what I've shared? What's been useful? Uh, the experience with common uh, yeah, yeah, a little bit, yeah. I mean, we went, we visited one of their um, gymnasiums and that again was, it was actually for, so it was like, it was like, uh, like so it was like the very smart yes, yes. uh, specialised, the best teacher. So it wasn't um, Yeah, maybe not, but again it was, 